Welcome to everybody at our campuses today, especially anybody that's new, uh, folks at our King campus. We're so glad to have you and people in Clemens as well as Kernersville. Um, so happy to be with you and everybody that's joining us online today. It's a privilege to be with you. Are you ready for some good news? Though evil and temptation still rage, the devil has already been defeated. And though Christ is going to come again gloriously in wonder and power and resolve at all, his kingdom has actually already come. We're in a study of Revelation, and uh, today we are jumping right to chapter 20 to talk about what might be the most debated subject of end times and maybe even the most discussed and debated chapter in the Bible where it talks about this thousand year reign that is called the millennium. And uh, I want to present maybe what some of you might consider an alternative view, um, but I want to in the end, not so much give you a lecture on all the different views of the millennium as to encourage you in um, your place in the kingdom of God. My nephew Coble and Becca had a big party, a uh, big wedding party this past weekend up in the mountains at a beautiful venue. Uh, Friday and Saturday, they had uh, friends come in from around the nation, old friends and family, and uh, it was a wonderful celebration. I've been very close to my nephew Coble, and we love Becca so much. Uh, their wedding party, their, their full-on wedding party, it was this past weekend, but they got married a uh, little, about a year ago. It was one of those pandemic weddings, and it was a sight. Um, they, uh, they were married at, a, at her home church that has under a lot of restrictions last summer. A uh, very small crowd was allowed, and they uh, had said, the, uh, the committee of that church had said it needed to be outdoors in the courtyard. So we did it in the courtyard. People had their masks on, and, uh, and there was a storm that was brewing. And, and I've never had this happen before, but in the middle of the wedding, as we got near the time of their vows, uh, the thunder just clapped wildly. And it was, the storm was right on top of us. The, the lightning was right on top of us. I just uh, was uh, turned to the pastor of the church who was sharing in the, in the wedding with me, looking like, what do you do? And he said, he said, I forget whatever the committee rules are at the church, we're going inside. We went inside to the chapel uh, in the middle of the wedding. Never, I've never changed locations in the middle of actually officiating a wedding service. Went in, not having been expected, the air condition wasn't on, sat in the chapel in the heat, I could feel the sweat trickling down my back underneath the robe, and officiated, we got married, and um, we had a simple, they had a simple little reception afterwards. Um, but the big party was this, was this past weekend. Uh, when they were uh, making their plans to, uh, whether just to postpone the wedding or to go ahead and get married, and they were just ready to get married and they wanted to see what I thought, I said, get married. And they said, well, could, could we do a big renewal of vows? You know, almost like recreate the wedding a year later so when all our friends could come. I said, we could, we could. But I said, I don't know that you're gonna feel like doing that a year from now. And sure enough, they didn't. And the wedding party uh, was just that. They had uh, a, a dinner on Friday night, dinner on Saturday. They had all this fun time with their friends, but they had already been married for a better part of a year. They already had made their covenant. They already, they already had been sharing their life together. They, they, had, they had already experienced all the stuff that goes into marriage. They just had some restrictions on how much they were able to celebrate it all until after restrictions had been lifted and now all the friends came with, with unmasked faces. I want to suggest to you that that's sort of the view I want to present of the Christian life with you today from Revelation 20. I, I think that the church is like the bride and Christ like the groom. And we have been united to Christ. We have, we, in Christ, we have already been engrafted into um, 
not just uh, all of the promises of the covenant, but our whole inheritance. It's already ours, though may not be that every piece of it has been appropriated yet. And there is going to be a kingdom party in a new heaven and a new earth that's going to go on forever, and it's going to be, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. But we don't have to put off until some future party the fact that we've already been taken in by Christ in covenant. And we already have been made more than conquerors in him. So I want to present to you today um, what might be sort of an alternative way that some of you think about the, the millennium by suggesting to you that the millennium is a picture of the kingdom of God that began with Christ's coming the first time and concludes with Christ coming the second time. In other words, the kingdom of God is at hand. When I was a freshman in college, I went to uh, Grant Rack Wacker's introduction to Christianity in America. And I remember uh, the day that Professor Wacker said um, that when it comes to uh, end times, that there are three, there are several main views. He said there's premillennialism, which believes that Christ comes back. And then there is a literal thousand years that goes along sort of a golden age. Um, and then there's a fierce time of tribulation and, um, and judgment. And then there is a post-millennial view, which says that there is this thousand years and it's a, a, a wonderful progressing time of the gospel going forward. And some people even believing that God's rule and law is starting to see be in effect. Um, and then after this long thousand year uh, time of the gospel prospering and things being so much better, then Jesus comes back, post-millennialism. And Professor Wagner said, and there's amillennialism. Ah, is this the little prefix that means not or no. And what it really means is not no millennium, but a millennium that's already going on. And um, that's really the view I lean towards, and I'm going to tell you why to die. But then he said, and then there's pan-millennialism. And uh, that's where everything just pans out in the end. And uh, I got a good uh, chuckle out of the class. And for I didn't realize that then for most of my Christian life, uh, I really wouldn't study all of this. And I probably was a pan-millennialist just thinking, well, I'm not going to worry about it. Everything will just pan out in the end. So you wonder, why does it even uh, matter that much? Well, I think it matters a lot because of what it does for our whole hope and how we live in the world now. Let me just give you a real quick summary of these. I'm not going to have time to go through all the details of these three different approaches to the millennium. But the premillennial approach believes that the binding of Satan is still in the future. It'll take place when Christ returns. The thousand years is a literal period of time. Um, Christ will reign on earth from Jerusalem with his people. The loosing of Satan will bring the millennium to its climax, followed by the resurrection and the judgment of the wicked at the great white throne. The new heaven and new earth will be created after that literal thousand years and after Christ's coming. The post-millennial approach, some interpret um, Revelation 20 similar to the amillennialists, but they have this optimism about the gospel in the present age. And um, some of them see the binding of Satan as a future point when successful preaching of the gospel will effectively reduce Satan's influence down to where it's nothing. The thousand years for a lot of post-millennialists is uh, literal, but for some it's not. Um, a final attempt on the part of the loosed Satan at the end of time will get nowhere and a general resurrection and judgment uh, will occur. The amillennial approach, which again, I, amillennial is the wrong phrase for this. Somebody needs a better phrase. It really is more like realized millennium or millennium that has come or the kingdom that's already here. And this approach says the binding of Satan represents the victory of Christ over the powers of darkness accomplished at the cross. And the thousand years is symbolic of a long indeterminate period corresponding to the age of the church, which is now. And Satan will be loosed briefly to wreak havoc and to persecute the church in the end of the present age. 
fire coming from heaven and consuming the wicked is symbolic of Christ's second coming. A general resurrection and judgment of evil and good will occur at Christ's coming, followed by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. And most of what I'm saying today is really going to lean towards that perspective. Uh, I think it's really important a couple of things to mention uh, when you think about a, a, a controversial text like this is that scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. You always like to take a <clears throat> more clear text and let it help you interpret less clear texts. And you'll see some of that in my interpretation today. <clears throat> also, um, the, uh, the end times theology that we debate so much is largely something that we all agree on in most of its basics. And here's, here, here are some things that almost all Bible-believing uh, Christians really agree on. There'll be a sudden personal return, uh, bodily return of Jesus Christ to come to this earth. Um, we should eagerly look for that and, and long for Christ's return. We all agree we don't know when it's going to be. And all agree that that final return will result in the judgment of unbelievers and reward of believers and that believers will live with Christ in a new heaven and a new earth. So if you believe those things, you're in agreement with most people regardless of their perspective. And so I think my assignment uh, for this text is to encourage you, to strengthen you, and um, <clears throat> I'm coming at it from this one particular angle, and I think you'll see why. Let's dive in. Revelation 20, <clears throat> verse 1. Now, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. First, let's start, as we've been saying throughout, this is highly symbolic language, isn't it? Uh, a great chain is certainly not something that anybody thinks is literal, that spiritual beings aren't confined by physical chains. Um, it is just a symbol of somehow uh, Satan is bound, right? And the dragon or serpent, obviously that's a symbol of the devil. The pit, <clears throat> it would be, uh, seem kind of silly to think of that as a physical pit that would somehow be containing a spiritual entity. It's some kind of symbol. And um, as I've suggested all along, numbers in Revelation are highly symbolic. And this is why I don't think that the thousand years is meant to be taken literally. I, uh, <clears throat> when Abby, our daughter, was little, every night I put her to bed and I'd say how much I love you. And it grew over time because it was always, I love you more than a million and it'd be something. And then she'd fill in the blank. And every special occasion, you know, Christmas, Easter, her birthday, I'd give her a new, I love you. And after a while, this thing built up to, you know, over 20 I love you's that we'd try to remember them all. I can't remember them all, but I definitely remember I love you more than a million Ghirardelli hot fudge Sundays. I'd say I love you more than a million Ghirardelli and she'd fill in the blank hot fudge Sundays. Well, every time I say I love you more than a million Ghirardelli hot fudge Sundays, I didn't mean that if you gave me a million and one hot fudge Sundays that I'd like that better than you, Abby. That's not what I meant. It's a figure of speech. Well, thousand is a number like that. Um, we've seen that seven is a number that means something that is quantitatively complete. 10 is a number that means maybe qualitatively and, and, and in some ways uh, the whole content of it is there. there are 10 fingers, 10 toes, it's all there. And seven uh, added to three, the number of days of creation and the triune number three put together become a very holy number, 10. And so a thousand is a multiple of, of 10. And most of the places where we see a thousand, it just, it means something like often when we'll say a million, we just mean a whole long period, a whole full period, a long time. Psalm 90 verse four, a thousand years in your sight or but yesterday when it's past. Um, we don't mean, well, a thousand and one days are, are more than a day to you. That's not what we mean by that. Or Psalm 50 for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. We don't mean that on the thousand and first hill, those cattle belong to somebody else, right? 
uh, Ecclesiastes, even though he should live a thousand years twice over, uh, we don't mean that literally. Second Peter 3, 8, don't overlook this fact that the Lord, with the Lord one day is a thousand years. Almost every place in the Bible and in Revelation, a thousand is used symbolically. And so I don't see why we should suddenly think that the thousand years needs to be literal. Um, and like I would say, you know, for all of the interpretation of this, there's a, there's a little part of me that says, uh, I don't know, of course, I could be wrong about that, but, uh, but I believe that, that it's not literal. And that's really important because I think that these symbolic numbers are um, indicative of how you then shape your whole interpretation of this chapter and of all of Revelation. So this, these opening verses speak of this binding of Satan. There is a chain, there is a pit, um, it has been shut up, it has been sealed. And one of the sort of criticisms of the more amillennial view is it says, well, it sounds like in these verses that Satan has been completely uh, and thoroughly bound. But you'll see that the text actually really doesn't say that everything about Satan has been bound, but it tells us that he might not deceive the nations any longer. There is some specific information that's given here. And so I just want to take a moment and say that I know that in many ways, especially for us in America as Christians, we really mourn the loss of some of the Christian morality that we might have seen more of in decades past. And it grieves me so much, you know, the, the, the rampant uh, sexual confusion, the, um, uh, the uh, abortion, the uh, incredible defaming of the name of God, all of this that we see. And I know that in some ways it just seems like evil's getting worse. But I want to suggest to you that maybe that's not really the case. And what if, what if this binding of Satan that is described in the opening verses of Revelation chapter 20, what if that binding of Satan has already taken place because of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What if when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand and sent his disciples out to preach that word, what if when Jesus on the cross said it is finished, what if there was an inauguration of the kingdom of God that is symbolically displayed as this thousand years of his, of his reign? And what if through that cross and through his resurrection, there was something so decisively accomplished that it bound, not completely, but bound the devil? Doesn't that change everything? And if that's the case... It might be that in a lot of ways, the world's been getting better. I mean, let me give you this real quickly. I've shown these statistics a couple years ago, and I know it kind of, you kind of scratch your head and go, what, what are you saying here? But, but just look at this, a couple of United States statistics, homicide rate um, uh, per 100,000 has gone from 8.5 to in 2018, uh, 5.3. Um, we read, we hear about every murder, but we're actually got less of them. Uh, poverty rate gone from 12% to, to 7%. Even pollution. We, have, we actually have less pollution. That's not something you ever, ever hear about in the news. World statistics here, ongoing wars. Okay, that's a negative thing, right? And in 88, we had 23. In 2018, 12. I, I, again, I don't have the updated numbers of what's going on in the world this year, but if you think about poverty, extreme poverty has gone from 37% to 10. Um, autocracies, we agree, where they're dictators and no freedom. and all, That's bad, right? Well, that's really diminished from 85 to 60. Uh, look at some things like what's happening with life expectancy. Just in, just in the period of time from 88 to 2000, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, not 88. I, that's, a, that's a wrong stat. I think that's supposed to be 1888. But but it, or 1780, just within a couple hundred years, it, it's gone from just a little over 30 years of age. And some of us can even remember just hardly, hardly 100 years ago. It's like somebody would live to 80 would be a very unusual thing. Now, globally, the, the, the whole 
whole world, including all the places that have the, the least medical care. People are living longer and, it, and up to age 70 and to well over age 80 in highly developed countries. People are living longer. Child and infant mortality rates are uh, gone down over the 250 years tremendously. Um, and in the richest countries, 250 years ago, a third, a third of the children died before age five, just 250 years ago. Today, in the poorest countries, only 6% of children die before age five. And you might say, I know, okay, I hear all that, but, but you know, it just feels like things are getting worse and we got less and less Christians. Not so. In 1970, uh, by one study, there were 1.2 billion Christians and today they're 2.5 billion. I know the population has increased greatly, but even taking that into account, there are more Christians in the world today than there were. And in 1970, there were 165 million atheists, today 138 million. The reason I'm putting this up here is to say, what if, even in these things that are just signs of a better life, what if something happened where Satan has been limited? What if, what if, Maybe the gospel is advancing despite the setbacks and the ways we see this. You see, the defeat of Satan has already been accomplished according to Paul in Colossians 2 verse 13. You who are dead in your trespasses and under the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against it with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailed it to the cross, disarmed the rulers and authorities, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them and him. Hebrews, the writer says, since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. I don't think there's some future millennium where that's supposed to take place. That's taken place already. Luke 11 speaks of uh, Jesus saying, here, if you see by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's not often a millennium sometime. It's some future time for Satan to be bound. That's already happened. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoil. Jesus said, I've already come. I've already brought my kingdom. And, and you know, when we were looking last week at this marvelous text in Revelation 5, where John just weeps because no one in heaven or earth is able to open the scroll that I say is a representation of the inheritance of the people of God. And then suddenly he's told not to weep anymore. And one of the elders says, don't weep. Behold, the lion or tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered. I, I, don't, I don't think that conquering work of Jesus is off in some future millennium. And so I know that People might look at this and go, but, but look at all this terrible. You can't think the devil is bound. It doesn't mean that he's bound in every single way. It doesn't mean he can still tempt. But we're told specifically he cannot deceive the nations. He cannot keep the gospel from going forward. And so the coming of Christ has brought his kingdom. The cross and the resurrection have made us secure and welcomed us as conquerors who in many ways are already reigning with Christ. And the devil's compared to a lion who roars, but has been very limited. And it's very important because this gives you confidence in the day of spiritual battle. I was one time with my wife many years ago visiting our uncle Stanley in Los Angeles and we are walking in a neighborhood called Larchmont, and uh, they, everybody still laughs and makes fun of me for this day. We're walking along, uh, and there's a big uh, wall next to this beautiful house. You can't see over the wall. We're walking along, and all of a sudden, and I'm standing the one closest to the wall on the sidewalk, and all of a sudden, it sounded like the Tasmanian devil. It sounded like something. <laughs> it, it was, 
<laughs> and this dog, this dog was trying to jump up, get his little face over it, and it was so loud and so awful sounding that I jumped out of my skin. My wife claims that I threw her towards the wall and jumped behind her. It's not true. And if she tells you that, it's not true. It's not true. <laughs> they claim I'm afraid of dogs. I'm not afraid of dogs. I'm just afraid of the Larchmont dog. And uh, and all the way down that path, as we're walking down on that sidewalk, that dog is his little head coming all the way down. And it was scary. I mean, he couldn't get us. He couldn't kill us. And I think most of the work of the devil is deception designed to create fear and to intimidate. And for those who don't know the Lord, um, who fall all into it, then there can be great destruction. But for us who are in Christ, I think that devil's already been bound in many restrictive ways. Verse 4, we continue. I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I think these are the 24 thrones we saw earlier in Revelation 4. I think this is representative of the people of God because there were 24 of them. I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony. It could be this is speaking of martyrs. Could be this is speaking of anyone who has sacrificed and their life has been taken them uh, for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image had not given themselves over but had been sealed by Christ, didn't have the mark of the beast on their foreheads or hands. We'll talk about that in a later message. And they came to life and reigned with Christ. He's seen this vision for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. And blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ. They will reign with him for a thousand years. There's so much discussion about who's on these thrones, when does this happen. And what I'm giving you an alternative view here is say, I think the devil has already largely been bound. And I think this is a reference to all of us who in Christ, who have been made alive together with Christ. Do you ever notice all the scriptures that just reiterate how alive we already have been made with Christ? We are ones who have come to life. I think the first resurrection he's speaking of is a spiritual resurrection. There will be a resurrection of the body that will come later. But Paul said in Colossians 3, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on these things where Christ is. John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they'd have life and have it abundantly. Ephesians 2, 4, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We we're not still dead in a spiritual sense. We're alive with Christ. And we have been seated with him, Paul says at verse 6. Raised up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. That's, a, that's an astonishing thing. He's not talking about in the millennium we're going to be seated with him. We're, we're in it now, beloved. It's not some future golden age. And we're already reigning with him. He raised us up to be reigning with him. Paul said in Romans, in all these things we are more than conquerors. We are, beloved, already alive in Christ. And you could say that is the first resurrection. And there's much debate about this and how could you, that sounds symbolic when maybe it should be literal. But we've been made alive with him. And there will be another time in which all who have died in Christ are going to get a physical resurrection. Okay, so there is a literal resurrection. But clearly the scripture talks about we're not waiting for some golden age where we become alive or seated with Christ or reign with him. We're already, we're already more than conquerors. And then comes this final battle, verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. This is reference largely to Ezekiel passages. And Gog and Magog, I think, just represent probably all that is against Christ to gather them for their battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. They march up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That's the the new Jerusalem, the picture of the people of God in a new heaven and a new earth. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. 
the judgment of God in Jesus Christ came. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were. We'll come to the beast and the false prophets and other messages. And be tormented day and night forever. So do you see that there's not an actual battle that takes place. There's a gathering. This is the image you get. A gathering for a battle and then a sudden and swift judgment in which it all is consummated by Christ and the devil's thrown and into an, a complete, uh, a completely bound, forever solitary confinement, never going to be on parole. And it just happens, you see. And so there's not really a literal battle, I don't think. I think this is a spiritual battle that is all consummated when Christ returns. Sam Storm says, Armageddon is a prophetic symbolism for the whole world and its collective defeat and judgment by Christ at his second coming. Armageddon is not a specific place that can be located or reached with the help of GPS equipment like Babylon and Euphrates in the book of Revelations. Armageddon is a typological symbol of the final battle between God and his enemies. There is going to be a, a seemingly instantaneous defeat of evil that consummates what Christ has already done through the cross. So here's what I'm saying, beloved. Uh, my nephew, Coble and his sweet wife, Becca, they got married amidst lightning and thunder and masks and limited crowds and had to even change their location and adjust to some things. But despite those limitations, they were really married. And all that goes into being married is theirs. They share their life. They share their, they share intimacy. They share, they share their joys and they share their struggles together. They share a common future. They share a, 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 a covenant together. All that had taken place, right? And they really are. So they, everything about being married, they're not, they weren't waiting until they had a big party a year later. The big party a year later was just, okay, pandemic feels like it's over. Masks come off. Everybody can come from around and we'll just party. And it was wonderful. And there is going to be that for us. Christ is going to come back. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. Evil will be finally completely judged and, and washed away from the earth. Satan will, will have no more ability to deceive at all in any way. And we will just have an ongoing party. That's, that's the ultimate picture of what heaven's all about. But, but now here, we don't have to wait for some future age of the church. We don't have to wait for that because the kingdom of God is at hand. It means that Jesus doesn't have to do something else to defeat the devil in addition to what he did through the cross and the resurrection. All he's got to do is come back and consummate it. And it means that you don't have some limitation in your capacity as one who's seated with Christ to now reign triumphantly with Christ in this world in a spiritual way way. So look forward to the party that's going to come, but don't postpone all the great stuff of what it means to already be wed to Christ. We are his and we are redeemed and we are seated with him and we're already in a deep sense reigning with him. Satan has been thrown out of heaven. He cannot accuse the believer because we've been so thoroughly forgiven. And Satan has been bound by the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection such that he can't stop the gospel from moving forward. There's going to be, at the end of time, there's going to be a tribulation. There's going to be a time in which things get a lot more intense. But even that, if you're on this earth, you don't have to fear it because you're in Christ. Christ reigns. And you, in Christ, are already part of that glorious kingdom. And that's the gospel.
The Bible clearly teaches that uh, those that hate God and rebel against God will be, will be judged. The Bible clearly teaches there's a literal, literal personal devil and fall, these fallen angels that are demons. All of that is, is, is real. To say that revelation is symbolic is not to say that it's not true. Every word of it's true. It's just most of it's not mean taken literally. And so there's been a lot of speculation about literal formation of battles and literal figures in history that might represent different characters in Revelation. And I think that most of that misses the point. The bigger point, both to those that were suffering persecution in the first century and to us who suffer in a variety of ways and even in our own culture may suffer persecution for being Christians. The bigger point was this. There was a moment in time, decisive moment in history at the coming of Christ in which he inaugurated a kingdom and through his cross made a public spectacle in the heavenlies and disarmed principalities of evil and through his resurrection assured and guaranteed victory for him and for all who are in Christ over death. And that inaugurated a kingdom rule and we are part of it. Yeah, I think that really the, what we call the millennium, I think it's, we're in it. If you have a different view, don't get lost in that. We'd love to have a long time to talk about all of it. The bigger point is this, Christ is reigning. And so the first and most important thing, if you're joining us, especially if you're new, the most important thing right off is to say, Christ loves you and he came and died for you so that you would not be controlled by the devil anymore. If you've never said yes to his saving love and mercy, accept him today. You can say, Lord, I, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I need a savior and I believe in you. Come into my heart. I receive you by faith. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and make me your child and heir with you forever. And when you do, you are one of the saints you may not feel like it, but you're, you're already seated with Christ. It's amazing. And for all of us who are in Christ and all of us who have been, been walking with him for a long time, I'll leave you with this encouragement. Um, we are the betrothed. We are the ones that are already, already united with Christ. We're already in covenant with him. And, and as such, we are heirs with him and we share in, in his, his, his resurrected life. We will one day celebrate together in a new heaven and a new earth. But let's not put off to some future golden age what is really ours now. What we have in our hands now is that there's a devil who's been bound and he can't take your life and he can't take your hope and he can't take your joy and he can't take the gifts of the Holy Spirit flowing through you to change someone's life and he can't stop the gospel from going forth. Tell somebody about him this week. Tell somebody about the love of God. And may God bless you and keep you. And be kind and gracious to you. And make his face to shine upon you. And give you his peace. Now and always.